Um, tonight, we're going to continue on in our series we've been in, in what book of the Bible? So in Ecclesiastes. And uh, tonight, uh, this is the second to last message in that series. A month and a half goes pretty quick, okay? Um, so we're doing six weeks in Ecclesiastes, and then after that, we're going to begin a, a month-long series. And tonight's message actually kind of stands on the border uh, between those two. So tonight, we're going to focus on the theme of work, of work and vocation in the book of Ecclesiastes. But just in two weeks, we're going to start a four-week uh, series called Labor of Love. Uh, that is what we're going to do essentially is take a month to kind of build out a Christian perspective on work and, and vocation. And that's going to play kind of like a positive role, building a positive Christian biblical worldview of what work is, what it's not, what it should be for us, and so on. And, uh, but tonight in Ecclesiastes, as with like most weeks in this series, Ecclesiastes doesn't play a very positive role in the Bible, does it? <laughs> it, plays, it plays the negative role. Remember, Ecclesiastes, it plays the role of a wise gardener. Who knows that before you can grow healthy fruits and vegetables, you need to plow up the ground, you need to dig out the weeds and hack away the brambles, right? Which can be a painful, difficult process. You need to get rid of distorted views of work and vocation before we can truly hear the good news about the Christian redemptive view of work and vocation. And so tonight's the bad news, sorry, sorry. But uh, depending on how you feel about your job right now, you might actually hear it as good news. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure. Um, turn to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 with me. We're just going to kind of dive in. The first words of the book really get us into the core ideas, and we'll just kind of reacquaint ourselves and then dive into this, this theme of work, which we'll actually see in, in the first words. Ecclesiastes 1, verse, verse 1. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So it's this Solomon-like figure whose voice we're hearing in the book. And uh, the pronouncement of this teacher is meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, uh, I've said this many weeks, but the point is repetition leads to, to, to memory and so on. So what's the Hebrew word the author uses here, the teacher? Hevel, does it mean the same thing as meaningless does in English for us? No, okay, remember it doesn't. So remember literally, we'll throw this up here again on the slides. The word hevel, which means smoke or vapor. I said that with an accent that I've never had, but smoke. Why did I say that? <laughs> it just kind of came out, sorry. So smoke, that's what I mean, smoke. Smoke, what is that? Smoke. Smoke. I don't know what that is. So anyway, smoke. Smoke means smoke or vapor. And it's a metaphor that the teacher uses in two different ways, right? To mean fleeting or temporary, right? Here one moment, gone the next. But also something more concrete than that, as if smoke, when you look at it, it seems like it's there and that you can touch it. It seems like a thing, but then the moment I try and grasp it or make sense of it, it eludes me. And that's how life is under the sun, here. It seems like it makes sense, but then when we try and make it make sense half the time or most of the time, life falls apart on us or it doesn't go the way we thought it would. We can't make it work the way we want it to. It's like Hevel. It's like Hevel. Okay, so everything's Hevel. Everything's Hevel where? Where? Look at verse 3. What do people gain from all of their labors at which they toil? Where? Under the sun. Okay, there, we're already talking about work. No. This is the first sentence of the book. We're talking about work. And work where? Under the sun. So remember, this is the other key word in the book of Ecclesiastes. Under the sun refers to life in this world as we presently experience it. A world of enigma and paradox. A world that has been compromised by, by human sin and folly and selfishness. And because of that, because of the fallenness of humanity, it's wreaked havoc in God's good world. And so we, the, way we don't, the way we experience life isn't fully as God intended us to experience life. And so, but somehow we, we all know that and we all experience how screwed up the world is, is all of the time, right? But somehow, when what the teacher is concerned is, with is that we continue to work and live and operate as if ultimate like happiness and and ultimate lasting fulfillment really is possible here under the sun. 
we, we say we don't think it is, but we live and work as if we think it is. And the way that we know that is because when we don't find ultimate happiness and significance and fulfillment under the sun here, we get, we get we utter despair, we get ticked off at God and blame it on him as if it's God's fault. <laughs> and the whole point of the story of the Bible is just God's fault. It's our fault for the reason why the world is the way that it is. And so he's going to take us down every possible dead end of where humans look for meaning and significance and fulfillment and so on, and show us that it's a dead end, and that apart from God, it's a dead end. And so tonight, he's going to take us down the dead end of work, which might seem quite depressing, because this is like what we do with most of our waking hours, you know what I'm saying? Sleeping and working, that's like what we do with most of our lives, right? And so, but we have to go here. This is a major theme in the teacher's in the teacher's words. And so here's this question, verse 3. I want you to look down at it again. He's going to ask here, he's going to ask, what do people gain from all of their labors at which they toil here under the sun? What do we gain from all of this work that we spend most of our waking hours doing? Or maybe you're not spending most of your waking hours working, and there might be many reasons behind that. You might be trying to find work, and you're frustrated because you can't, or maybe you're intentionally trying not to find work, and that's the joke about young people in Portland or whatever. But I, it's more of a stereotype than reality, maybe. I don't, maybe I just don't know the right people. Anyhow, so uh, we're aware of the fact that we aren't working if, if we aren't. And he's asking, what do we gain? What do we gain? What do we get from all of this work that we do, this pursuit of work? And some of us might think, okay, this, we're just, already this is too like, abstract and philosophical because, dude, what, what do we work? We work to get a paycheck to survive. You know what I mean? Like, that's what we're doing. That's what, that's what we gain. I get a paycheck. I survive. I provide for myself and for those who depend on me. If I have people depending on me, that's what we work for. And the teacher says, yes, of course, All right? That's a given. But that's not what he's asking here. He's not asking, that's compensation. You work to receive con compensation. What he is asking is, what, what over and above mere survival do we get for all of the work? He's asking, what's the gain? Not the compensation, what's the gain? And he's working with this idea that we know kind of in the modern world through this uh, famous little, little pyramid. There was an uh, educator, psychologist, and he was Abraham, you guys know about this? Maslow. Yeah, he made this kind of famous, it's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And his basic point is that human beings aren't just like ants. But things that make ants happy do also make us happy. But we need also much more to make us happy, right? So we need food, shelter, cl clothing, get our physiolo physiological needs taken care of. But humans, above and beyond ants, we need also safety and security. We need also community and loving relationships. And also we just have this nagging sense that to, to become more of a fully healthy human, we need to find significance. We ne I need to do something that seems to have meaning and fits into some larger story or some larger significance or something like that. And so that's what he's getting at here. We work, yes, to provide for your needs and to survive, but what he's asking is, but do we actually get to the upper parts of the pyramid of self-actualization or significance or fulfillment from all of the labor that we do? And he's essentially going to come to the conclusion that kind of a little bit, not really, so no. <laughs> that's, that's where he's going to lead us. That's where he's going to lead us. And, and to do that, I want to kind of paint, get a mental image in our heads. I think that'll help us as we kind of sort through in, in chapters two and four to see where he talks about work, work more. So uh, yesterday, was yesterday a glorious day or what? You know what I'm saying? I forgot that these days happen. In, this is my first winter back in Portland after many, many years. This, yesterday was amazing. So Jessica and I, we did the only sensible thing you do on a sunny, warm February day in Portland. We went to the beach. What you, and did anybody go to the beach yesterday? I'm curious. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, it was nice here. Yeah, it was nice here. Wasn't it sunny and warm here? Yeah, it was great. It was sunny and warm at the beach. And I just said I could wear a T-shirt, and it was sunny, and I was actually sweating in the sun in February on the beach. It was wonderful. So anyhow, so uh, we went on a hike, one of our favorite hikes and so on, and we ended the day um, with sunset at, at Cannon Beach because it's a convenient place and it's wonderful, nice beach and so on, lots of people. 
And uh, so we were kind of walking and, and, and talking as, uh, as the sun was setting. It was beautiful, stunning. And all of a sudden, I, I had all these memories of Cannon Beach as a kid. So one, one day a year, usually in the first week or so of June, every year at Cannon Beach, what awesome event happens at Cannon Beach? Do you know? Sandcastle Day. Yeah, Sandcastle Day. It's the, like, National Sandcastle Day at Cannon Beach. Did you know this? How many of you have been to Sandcastle Day at Cannon Beach before? It's always in the first week of June. So this year is like June 10th or something like that. And th hundreds and hundreds of sculptors come from the region, from the world, to Sandcastle Day. And Cannon Beach is not big. And it, it fills up with about 10,000 extra people for the weekend of Sandcastle Day. And world-class sculptors. And so... 8 a.m., people register, and you go out. The tide has gone out, and people uh, go to the wet sand. They all like, have kind of marked out where the different lots are and so on that people register for. And you got seven hours because you, you start at 8 a.m., you got till 3 p.m. to finish your project. And it is epic what these people accomplished. Do you know, have you seen pictures before? I have to show you pictures because it's irresistible, right? So, so these are just two. Just, I mean, un so here's one of Smokey. Smokey the Bear, right? So it's not the corny 70s cartoon. It's like uh, this one here. And then this is this wonderful castle scene. And it's actually uh, Rapunzel. Can you see a guy trying to climb out the lady's hair in the window? She's climbing a lock of hair, right? And the, oh, there, thank you. <laughs> right. Thanks, Erica. That's awesome right there. Yeah. And like these trees. It's unbelievable. Okay, so some are amazing and breathtaking like this. Some are creepy. Like, <laughs> like this next one here, you'll see this totally creepy. What is that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like somebody was like, yeah, this would be meaningful or something. So anyhow, so there you go. So Sandcastle Day, hundreds of entries, right? And they line the beach, hundreds of, of world-class sculptors. It's, it's epic. And I actually can't remember how many times I went as a kid. Jessica and I were having this conversation. Did I go four different summers growing up? Did I go two, but it's so awesome it felt like four? In my memory, I'm not sure. But uh, so, so by 3 p.m., everybody has to stop because uh, then the judges come and they take pictures and they begin to evaluate and so on because what happens at five, about five o'clock? What's going to happen? What makes the sand wet? Because the tide went out and it's all the wet sand. What's going to happen at five and it's the most, tr it's utterly tragic. <laughs> it's totally tragic to watch because uh, the tide begins to come in and it kind of slowly, slowly erodes, right? And those first waves begin to take over the sculptures. And then 8 a.m. the next morning, you would never even know that Sandcastle Day took place. It's the ultimate tragedy, you know what I'm saying? It was all this planning going up to Sandcastle Day, the actual event itself, the judging, the awards, and then the next morning, it's gone. You'd never know. This is the teacher's view of human work and accomplishment. <laughs> Remember I said the first week, Ecclesiastes is like a wet blanket thrown over your life, right? And, and not to needlessly depress us, but to wake us up to the reality of life here in a fallen world under the sun. Go to chapter 2 with me and keep this mental image of, of building sandcastles. Chapter 2, verse 17. <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 17. He says, so, so I hated life. A great start to a new paragraph. Right? So I hated life because all the work that's done here under the sun, it's like it was grievous to me. I mean, all of it is hevel. It's here, it's here, and it's gone. It's over, it's gone. It's like, it's like chasing the wind. You, you, it's a lot of activity, but it never seems to actually amount to anything. And so I hated all of the things that I was toiling for here under the sun because Here's, here's the reality. I'm going to have to leave them to someone who comes after me. And, and who knows whether that person is, is wise or going to be foolish. But yet, they're going to have control over all of the fruit of my toil into which I poured all of this effort and skill here under the sun. This is, this is heaven. This is heaven. So my heart began to despair 
over all of this toilsome labor here under the sun. Because, listen, you can labor with wisdom and knowledge and skill. You might, like, rock making your sandcastle. You know, make the best sandcastle ever. Or maybe you'll make creepy sandcastles. You know, whatever, right? But you're going to have to leave it. You're going to have to leave it to somebody or something at some point. You will have to stop whatever it is that you're doing at some point. It's guaranteed. It's the uncertain certainty in life. You're going to have to stop whatever it is you put your hand to in life and leave it to another who hasn't put in what you have put in, who hasn't worked for it. This is Hevel. He says it's a great, it's a great misfortune. So, so, so in other words, what he's getting at is he says we... On this, this hierarchy of needs. Yes, we work to survive and get a, get a paycheck, but there is something inside all of us that is hoping that we can do more than merely survive. And many human beings, not all, but many human beings actually get to climb a little higher on the pyramid with their work and with their accomplishment. And one of the major motivators, he believes, is this desire to leave a legacy, to make an impact to leave behind something of significance in the world. Is this a good desire? Yeah, we're going to take four weeks to explore that desire and how good it is and how God-given. Yeah, that's part of the image of God inside of us is to do something and contribute something of value and beauty and goodness to the world. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. But here under the sun, in, in a fallen world, am I guaranteed that what I put my hand to will have that kind of contribution, that lasting contribution to the world? Do I have any guarantee? And his answer is, no, you have no guarantee. Because it might not be the ruthless tide that comes away and take your sandcastle. It might actually be like your kids who squander like what you give them after you retire or something, you know? It might be whatever. Like you, you build a business or you build a, a, a corpus of work or something, of, of art or, or creative work or something, whatever it is, and you hand that off to the world, to someone, you have no guarantee. You have no guarantee. And for the teacher, he says, that's Hevel. That's Hevel because... You're saying that's what's going to make all of these years of work meaningful to you, but yet they will become Hevel. They will at some point. The tide will come and wash it away. No guarantee whatsoever. That's a happy notion. <laughs> that's a happy notion. And so some of us may have recognized that. We may have come to a healthy recognition, like, okay, yeah, I, I recognize there is a degree to which I'm making castles in the sand, and my goal is not to leave my mark on the world and, and to gain significance by that means, but at least I want to enjoy what I'm doing while I have to do it, yeah? I get some satisfaction. If I can't get this, this long-lasting payoff of, of leaving a mark on the world, maybe I can get some psychological payoff, you know what I'm saying, of just satisfaction or enjoyment of our work, <laughs> which he also deconstructs. Look at verse 22. Because he says, yeah, listen, what? Verse 22, what, what is it that people get for all of this toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All of their days, their work is grief and pain. And even at night, their minds don't rest. This, too, is heaven. So he's saying, not only do we not get what we are looking for out of a life of work and accomplishment, because it doesn't make a lasting impact, but what we do get is something that we don't want, which is stress <laughs> and anxiety and like physical pain and, and grief. So in other words, we might... Some of you have had this experience, if you've ever tried like starting your own business or something like that. Or let's say you, you say, I'm, I'm going to try and move in the direction of my passions or my strengths and gift and my skill set, okay? So then you start into a career or a job where it's not just like mindless work and you just, whatever, you just check the hours or something like that, but really I'm going to give myself to work that is meaningful, that's tied to my passions and giftings and so on. Is that a recipe for a stress-free life, that kind of job? No, it's actually a recipe for a much more stressful life because you carry work everywhere you go because it's tied to who you are and your passions, you know what I'm saying? So people you know who like start small businesses out of their passions and dreams 
Are these like relaxed people who have long weekends at the beach every week? You know what I'm saying? No, these are the hardest working people you've ever met. And, you're, and they're totally stressed because are we going to make overhead this week? <laughs> you know, are we going to make it this month? Are things going to meet and we don't? It's stressful. It's hard. And while there's joy in it because it's connected to my passions, the teacher is going to force you to ask. You can say, listen, listen. Is it re- put it in the scales of a balance. Yes, you're finally getting to do something that you enjoy, but you're also constantly losing sleep. You just, not only... Is it stressful when you're awake? He says, you can't even sleep, right? You can't even sleep. Because at night, you're sitting there staring at the ceiling, wondering, what's tomorrow going to bring? Grief, anxiety, pain? I don't know. You know so he says, it's not worth it. Is it really worth it? This is really depressing. <laughs> but it's also brutally honest at the same time, right? Because we, we get this sense about as we go about our work. Maybe you can't find work, and it's really frustrating to you, and it's true. Because humans go cuckoo when we don't have anything to do. We're meant to do this, the image of God stuff in us. But yet at the same time here under the sun, when we pursue it with all of our might and our passions and dreams, it ends up like ruling us and making us stressed out all of the time. Or it ends up totally just making us disillusioned because we realize I'm building castles in the sand for someone else who I don't even know. I've just seen like their name in a magazine or something like that. This is in terms of like corporate culture and, and, and the alienation that many of us feel from our work because we fit one piece or one part of a larger business or corporation and I don't know the people I'm actually working for and I, maybe you don't even see the people that the thing that you're working for benefits or serves. You know what I'm saying? It's just weird. It's weird. It's weird. It's castles in the sand that stress us out. So what's the point? What's the point? Turn to chapter 4 with me. He has one more dead end to explore. And you're like, two's enough. <laughs> Two dead, end, dead ends is enough. But I, actually, this, this is the most, the most uh, insidious and I think the deepest dead end of all. Because I could, I could come to convince myself that what I'm working for won't last and what I'm looking for won't be able to, to provide for me a sense, of, uh, a sense of significance or leaving a legacy or an impact in the world. Okay, I've dealt with that. I've dealt with it. And I can get myself to a place of just, of just dealing with the pain and the grief. Oh, yeah, I forgot a quote, but I have to read this quote. Sorry. Um, there was a, there was a, a Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, book wrote in the early 1970s by a guy named Studs Terkel. Is this not the best name that you've ever heard? Studs Terkel. And I uh, won a Pulitzer. And what he did was he uh, was a journalist and he went around the country and he, conducting hundreds and hundreds of, of interviews with mostly uh, blue-collar America. And he called the, the book, uh, the book was excerpts of the interviews and quotes and so on, drawing together themes. The book is called Work, People Talking About What They Do All Day and How They Feel About What They Do. <laughs> That's the name of the book. And here's the first, the first paragraph of the book. He says, this is a book about work. And therefore, by its very nature, is about violence. Violence to the spirit as well as to the body. It's about ulcers as well as accidents. It's about nervous breakdowns as well as kicking the dog around. It's above all about the daily humiliations. To survive the day is triumph enough for the willing, walking, working, wounded among the great many of us. That apparently is the expression of what work does to us 40 years ago. <laughs> How Are we doing any better today? I'll leave that to your to your judgment. And so some of us might say, okay, I can't necessarily make a world-lasting impact. I may not be able to, to find a life free of stress, but maybe somehow, maybe what work can help me do is find myself. Maybe, maybe I can find a career or a job that will give me a sense of who I am and an identity to figure out what I'm about in the world. And the teacher says that's, that's the deepest delusion of all, that work can give you an idea of who you are. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. He says, And I saw that all toil and all achievement, 
Now, let's stop there. He's using two words for work here, and they're significant. So the first one is just the general word, work or labor, right? All work. But the second word he uses is, is some of you might have in your translations like skillful work or skillful labor. He's saying, let's say you like really rock at making sandcastles. You're like the best. You win like sandcastle day every single year, right? So you might just work whatever, or you might have great achievement and success at what you do. He's going to say it's all, all of this springs from or comes from one person's envy of another person. This is Hevel. This is Hevel. He says, it's like chasing, chasing after the wind. Envy, envy. So we think of envy and we think, okay, so all toil and all achievement comes from me wanting what you have. I'm envious. Like you have the awesome vintage bike or something. You have the cool car. And so I want that. So I'm going to work harder to get that. And that that's a part of what he's saying, but that's not the, the deepest part of what he's saying. It's not envy of your stuff. It's not envy of what you're working for. This is about the core motivation for why we work. He's talking about this deep sense of, of jealousy rooted in insecurity as a motivation for why, why we work. That's what he's getting at here. This, this envy that's a result of comparing myself to you. So for example, uh, we have a great many baristas here at, uh, at Dorf Oak. Did you know that uh, the Northwest Regional Barista Championships took place today? Did you know this? February 3rd, up in Seattle? Maybe you didn't know this, but you may have friends up there. And I know for a fact there's Dorf Hope people up at uh, the Northwest Regional Barista Championships. Whatever. So let's say what it's that feeling you're a barista, and you get up to the championships, and you're good. I mean, you can make the cool heart shapes or whatever on the top of your, you know, lattes or whatever. And like, you're good, you're good. But you get up to the championships and you realize you, you, all these other baristas and you have to face the facts like these people are way better than me. You know what I mean? Like I'm, in, I'm maybe a big fish in a small pond, but you get to the regional championships, I'm outgunned. You know what I'm saying? So it's that feeling, right, where you get around people who do what you do or do what you want to do. They do the same thing, and you just realize, holy cow, like they're better than me, and I can't do a darn thing about it. You know what I'm saying? Have you been in this position before? You're a musician, or you're whatever, you're, you're a parent, you're a mom, and like that other mom's kids never like slobber and drool or whatever, and Johnny was potty trained at two and a half or something, you know? And you're just, you just realize, oh my gosh, they're better than me, and I can't do a thing about it. And there's a whole bunch of us, there's a whole bunch of us for whom that is, that is such a great threat that we may not even realize it, but we internalize that so deep that it, the symptom of that insecurity results itself in, in, in competition, in excelling, in working even harder, maybe working to a degree that isn't healthy for us, or working in ways that we treat the people around us in ways that we wouldn't normally ever treat people but because we've got our eye on the prize, eye of the tiger or whatever, you know, because I'm, I'm going to succeed, I'm going to, you can't be better than me. You know, this is, this is what he's getting at here, envy of another. And so, and so what he's convinced of is that even though we might say that I'm working to provide a service, what he really believes is that we're working to provide ourselves with an identity and a sense of worth and value. That's what he's saying. So we might say, I'm working to get a paycheck, I'm working to get compensation. And he's saying, actually what you're working for is to get a life. You're, you're trying to prove that you're someone and justify your existence in the universe and justify that you're worth taking up space in the universe. <laughs> I'm just trying to say what he's saying in a different words. That's what he's getting at. He believes this is, this is a, one of the heart core motivations for human work. And he says it's Hevel. It's Hevel. Why is it Hevel? He says, because work cannot provide you with the sense of who you are. A sense of your self-worth and your identity and value isn't something that you can create. You can't make or manufacture that. It has to be something given to you. It's something you receive. And that truth is contained in this little riddle that he tells in verses 5. And Do you guys like riddles? So what's great is that the punchline of this whole thing comes in a riddle. It's a lot like Jesus' teaching, right? Verses 5 and 6. He tells this little riddle. The three dead ends, 
Work can make an impact. Well, actually, it can't, really. Work can bring me joy and satisfaction. Well, really put that in the scales. Actually, not really. It might be a little bit behind the scales. Work gives me an identity and a sense of who I am. Actually, it's Hevel because it's rooted in insecurity. And so he tells this little riddle in verses 5 and 6. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. He says, Fools fold their hands and they ruin themselves. Better is one handful with tranquility, or some of your translations have rest. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Hmm, it's a riddle. Hmm, you're supposed to have a cup of tea and just think about it. Yeah, that's what you do with riddles, right? You pause, you ponder. Do you get it? Do you get what he's saying? A little riddle. You can count. You can get the basic idea, right? So the, we might. There might be a whole bunch of us who we're ready to go quit our jobs right now. You know, <laughs> like what's the point? You know, what's the point? And he would say that's foolish. It's foolish because he says fools. Fold their hands. Okay, now, and also, look, in English, we have three words for hands here. We have hands, handful, handfuls. Because in English, this, we have basically have one word to refer to this thing. It's hand. In the, in the riddle in Hebrew, he uses three different words. Hebrew has three different words for hand, all with different nuances of meaning. Do you want to learn the three words for hands right now? Okay, you need to understand the riddle, I think. So he says, fools hold their yad, uh, fold their yad. Their yad. Uh, the yad is from your uh, fingertips to your elbow. So we call this like your hand, and then what do we call this? Like your forearm. So in, in Hebrew, yad is a way to referring to the whole thing. So even the way they divide up physiology. Is, isn't that interesting? Right? So yad, here's your yad. So what does it mean to fold your yad? What's, this is an image, it's a metaphor. What's he getting at with this image? Nap time. <laughs> right, nap time. Laziness. Laziness. So, in other words, to whether it's intentionally or to intentionally give up, to, to neglect the abilities or the skills or the opportunities that I could have if I were to put myself to it, to neglect that, to reject it, is foolish. He says, laziness is foolish. And we might think, well, wait a minute, like, you're totally like, motivating me to become lazy because what is the point of work? And he's like, you're, we're not there yet. You've got to get to the bottom of the riddle. Right? So, but, but laziness, the folding of my yad intentionally, to fold your yad is foolish. It's foolish. You're squandering what God has put in you. You're squandering the fact that you've been given life and breath and a chance to do something in the world and discover what that is. It's foolish. And it's a way to ruin yourself. Humans go cuckoo when we don't have anything to do. You realize this. Or we, like, turn to PlayStation 3 or Xbox or something, and that really makes you cuckoo in a whole other way, though, because you think you're fine, but actually you're being programmed to live in some other world, right? So, so you fold your yard, right? And that's foolish. You ruin yourself. You ruin your humanity by not having anything to do. So that's some people's response to Hevel under the sun. They fold their yard. That's one extreme. The other extreme is the last one that he mentions, which is two hand, handfuls of toil and chasing after the wind. And what's the, you want to take a crack at the last one there? It's the K-H is the ch, it's the clearing your throat letter in Hebrew, right? So chofen, chofen, why don't you say it with me? Chofen, chofen. So he says, fools fold their yad, that's, that's not wise. But equally, on the other extreme of not being wise is to live life with two chofen, which is these grabbing fistfuls like this. Is this is an equally unhealthy, hevel-like way to live. And can you just, can, do you get what he means just by the metaphor? This right here. What is this? Right, this, is, this, is, this is an approach to life where I'm trying to milk out of this job or this career or this life goal. I'm trying to get out of it all kinds of things that the teacher thinks you will never get out of it, right? And you, you work tirelessly, right? Because it's this grabbing posture to life. You're trying to get something out of these things that can never actually give you what you're looking for, which is this deep sense of worth or value, of joy or satisfaction that you're contributing to something meaningful, right? And I, I mean, we have a word for this in English. It's the... It's, um, 
the one, addictive beha- one of the addictive behaviors that we actually praise in modern America. Call it workaholism, right? And, and of course, because this person is so successful, look how hard they're, like, they're making sacrifices and they're working and so on. And uh, there was this, there was, uh, in the New York Times, there was a survey done not long ago about what if, uh, it was one of these kind of fun questions to figure out people's personalities. If there was an extra hour to the day, a 25-hour day, what would you do with that extra hour? What would you do? I'm hearing two people say sleep. Anyone else vote for sleep? Totally. Yeah, exactly. And that's always the majority answer, right? It's the majority answer. Why is that? Because we're exhausted. <laughs> we're exhausted. We're the, most, we're, we're the most overworked culture, at least for upper class jobs in America, most overworked people in the world. What's going on here? Somehow this is like an admirable trait to live life grasping with two, two chofen. In Portland, I'm not sure, right? which I kind of appreciate about the, the culture, at least of this city, but for some people, you know what I'm saying here. And he says it's foolish, it's hevel, because it won't give you what you're looking for because it's rooted, and it's rooted in insecurity and envy, he says. And sometimes some of us are honest about it that that's where this is all rooted in, is in my deep insecurity, and that's why I'm grabbing at life, right? Some of us are honest sometimes. People like Madonna are sometimes honest. And just listen to her words. This is, this is very powerful. You've heard of Madonna, I'm guessing. <laughs> she, says, she says, I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and then discover myself as a special human being and then I get to another stage and think that I'm mediocre and uninteresting again and again. My drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre and that's always pushing me because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. So that sounds like a great career, you know what I'm saying? That sounds like success and living with Tuchofen has really pushed her to a healthy place. At least she's honest about it. And what's funny is that this is the kind of honesty that you wonder if it's really honest because she, clearly she hasn't tra- changed her like, career trajectory, you know what I'm saying? She's still at it. She's still at it, and so are, so are many of us. And so the teacher, with his little riddle, he says, listen, it's foolish to fold your yard and to just check out of the game because you're going to ruin yourself. But at the same time, it's, it's futile to live life with this kind of grabbing posture. And so what does he commend? What does he commend? He commends this, this middle hand here, <laughs> the second hand. And he commends, he says, best is, is one handful with rest or with tranquility. And the word that he uses here is the word kaf, that just simply refers to the inside of your hand, the open palm right here. This is what he has in mind right here, an open palm. Because the moment you do this, it's chofen. But this is kaf. It's kaf. So he says one hand. So it's not folding your It's one hand. You're working. You're committed to something, to being productive. It's important for humans. And we'll explore this in the next teaching series with, for four weeks. It's, it's vitally important for our identity and worth, and for community to contribute and to be working in some way. But he says, this is the posture. One hand, the other hand's down, because you're resting. You're working, and you're in the game, and you're engaged, but somehow it's with an open hand. This is such a beautiful image. You're working from a place of rest. Is this a paradox? You're in a place of rest that that's what allows you to work. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. So somehow he thinks it's possible to, to have a posture in life where I'm working, I'm committed to something, and it's something more than just survival, that I'm actually looking to become the kind of human being God wants me to be, but I, I begin from a place of rest, and that's what allows me to commit myself, but with an open-handed approach. Because right? the moment you do this, then I'm trying to control the outcomes. We did a whole message about that a couple weeks ago, right? And he says, that's Hevel. It's an open-handed approach. And so this is, this, is, this is the riddle that he tells. It's a little Hebrew riddle. This is what he commends. And it leaves us just on the brink, because we're just like, okay, 
and? Like, how do you get here? How do you get here? This is, this is it. Apparently, this is the way to live right here, you know? So I'm resting from a place of deep rest, a hand in the game, but it's an open hand. How do you get there? And you read the book of Ecclesiastes and, right? Because what's the role of this book in the Bible, positive or negative? It's negative. He's exposing the brokenness of the human heart. He's exposing the reality of life here under the sun. He doesn't provide any ultimate solutions. That's not the point of the book. It's not the point of the book. It's one book in the Bible that's hacking away at the brambles and digging up the weeds to prepare us for something that can bring us rest. And it's here, I think, that some words of Jesus that may be familiar to you, but, but familiarity breeds contempt, or at least boredom, right? And so hear these words in light of the incisive critique and the hacking of the teacher. Hear these words of Jesus again for the first time. Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. There's a paradox at the heart of what he's saying here. Do you see it? Somehow, following Jesus is a burden. It's hard. It's difficult. Life is hard, and life is difficult. Can I get an amen? But, But somehow... Somehow, coming under the burden, I can, I, if I want, the teacher says, if you want, shoulder the heavy burden of work and toil on your own, you're welcome to it. It's going to destroy you, or at least give you ulcers, or at least make you really depressed. But go for it if you want. Right? Or I can, I can take on myself the burden, the burden of what Jesus has to give me. And somehow, it's a burden that brings rest. It's work that brings rest. It's a yoke. So he uses this image of of like what oxen or or cows or or donkeys would wear, this heavy wooden U-shaped or O-shaped thing that gets connected to like a cart that I pull along or something like that. So it's an image of something heavy over me, but this heavy thing that Jesus wants to put on us is actually going to bring us rest and freedom in life. So it's, actually, it's kind of another riddle, isn't it? Right? So what's he getting at? And I think what, what Jesus is always getting at is the heart of the human condition. And it's the heart of what he came to address. Ecclesiastes exposes the problem. Jesus comes to give the remedy and the answer. And, and the answer is, is ultimately this. You can shoulder this burden of finding meaning and significance and making an impact and finding joy. You can shoulder that on your own. The teacher says it's not going to go well. But you allow Jesus' burden to fall on you. What, what is that? It's the, word, it's the word of his teaching. It's the word of the gospel. And the good news about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and in the resurrection, it's this paradox because it's the, the, the cross and the gospel says the worst possible thing about you and me that we could possibly imagine. And that's a heavy burden to bear. At the same moment, it says the best possible thing about us that you could ever hope for or imagine, which is what gives freedom. And so the teacher's convinced that there's something broken inside you and me that's so deep, right? We're the walking wounded, as Stugs, Studs Turkle, I can't even say his name, right? Don't name your kid Studs, whatever you do, right? <laughs> so Studs Turkle, right? The, the working, walking wounded. He says it comes from this place of deep, self-centeredness, of insecurity, right? Of wanting to, to make for myself a life for myself. Don't tell me what to do. That's the form it takes for some of us. For others of us, it, come, it, it addresses us in the gospel and what the teacher points out is our deep insecurity and, and selfishness. And when that issues itself in a life of work, it creates seven billion human beings who make the world exactly what it is today. That's the bad news of the gospel. It's the burden 
that we need to take upon ourselves this word of Jesus that says, you and I are so deeply screwed up, we don't even realize how screwed up we are. And it results in these lives of work that make the world what it is today, under the sun, fallen and broken. But at the same moment that the teacher and, and Jesus exposes this deep brokenness Inside of us, it's also taking the burden of the gospel upon myself that gives me rest and freedom because the gospel says that here we are, a bunch of broken people, like just royally screwing up the world out of our deep insecurity and envy, right? And what is God's response to us? And we think, oh yeah, exactly. He's ticked at us and he's going to destroy us all, right? And so you can have that view of God if you want, but please don't associate that God with Jesus. Please don't. Please don't. That's not the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that here we are doing this to God's world and to other people made in God's image and doing all of this to ourselves. And what is God's response? His, God, his response is to come be with us in Jesus, to, to shoulder our burden upon himself. Right? So in, and in his life and, and on the cross, this becomes this symbolic moment. It's like a magnifying glass where the hevel of our world that we create because of our envy and insecurity and our ego, it's like it all gets magnified onto Jesus. And he lives this, this kind of loving life of rest and self-giving that you and I could only dream of living, right? We could only dream. I, can't, I, swear, I cannot live like Jesus. I can't. And to be honest with you, most of the time I don't want to. Let's just be real, you know what I'm saying? That's the heavy burden is being honest with myself about that. But right at that moment that, that I recognize that and I take that burden of Jesus upon, upon myself, he meets me right there. And he, and he says, I have lived this life for you. Somehow, somehow the son, as Paul said, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so that somehow I am actually dying with all of this envy, all of this insecurity, it's being put to death with Jesus on the cross. And the life that I now live and the life that I now go into my work and career and accomplishment, it's not me, it's Jesus living in me. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. It's Jesus living in me. Somehow through Jesus, I can become the kind of person that I could never become for myself because it's Jesus doing it. And so this is, this is the remedy that the teacher didn't have on hand, right? He exposes the problem, he tills the ground, and Jesus provides this great saving remedy for the working wounded here in the world. And the moment I, can, I internalize that truth, that God's love for me is so deep that he would do what Jesus did for me in his life, his death, his resurrection. He gives me his life. If you internalize that truth, it will completely transform your view of what you do eight to ten hours a day. Because all of a sudden, I'm not looking, I'm not doing this with my career and my job. And you know what? Like, Jimmy can be the best barista in the world. I don't care. I'll be 14th in the regional championships. You know what I mean? Whatever. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me, and I, I'm freed from now from a place of rest because my identity is, is not something I'm getting. My identity is something I receive from Jesus and his love for me. I'm freed to enter my work and to honor God and do the best of my, of my God-given abilities that I can with the opportunities that I have in front of me. And when I shoulder the, what the gospel, the bad thing the gospel says about me, I find the freedom into God's love for me, and I'm freed. I'm freed from the tyranny of work. That's the answer to the riddle that Jesus gives. How you guys doing? Tomorrow's Monday. You know what I'm saying? So, like, this isn't abstract. This is, like, real. It was real. You're doing, you're doing something with your life, whether you're folding your yad or whether you're grabbing with your chofen. You're do, we're doing something, we're looking for something. And Jesus says, it's, it's only when you take my burden on you that you will find rest, to work from a place of rest. And so some of us, we need to do that in a new way tonight because, because Monday is like this dark cloud over your life. And, and, and what we're doing with our eight to 10 hours a day, it, it may be extremely difficult. It may be very difficult. 
But even the most difficult thing can be transformed when you know that the most important person in the universe is just head over heels about you and gave his life for you and is present with you in that frustrating situation. It completely transforms your view of what you do with, with your days. And so some of us, we need to come to the cross tonight and we need to hear this, this critique and this hacking of the teacher and let him expose what's inside of us and then we need to take that and, and lay it at the cross and receive with an open hand the love of Jesus for you and for me. That's what our gatherings are for. That's what we're here to do tonight. Amen? Let me close us with a word of prayer.